All right, I want to go ahead and welcome everybody and thank you all for joining us today for today's webcast, Keys to Developing Strong Outbound Sales Efforts for Entrepreneurs, Startups, and Small Businesses. Uh, my name is Adam Wicks, and I am a Venture and Securities Attorney at Buchanan, Ingersoll, and Rooney here in Pittsburgh. I'm also the Chairman of the PBCA's Emerging Leadership Board, which is made up of representatives in the under 40 demographic from local investors, incubators, emerging companies, universities, and firms, and is proud to bring you today's webinar. The mission of the Emerging Leadership Board, or the ELB, is to connect, engage, and cultivate relationships within Pittsburgh's young professional venture capital community through mentorship, education, networking, and other strategic programs. Our ultimate goal is to increase membership and create a more diverse membership base within the PVCA among the local venture community. Before we get started, I want to go ahead and thank the PVCA's annual sponsors. We wouldn't be here without their generosity and kindness, both prior to and throughout the pandemic. Programs like these are only possible because of them. If you're interested in becoming a sponsor, please contact Micah Whitfield, the PVCA's Director of Business Development. The benefits of sponsorship include free Emerging Leaders membership for an individual from your organization under the age of 40, as well as complimentary attendance to all regular PVCA virtual events for sponsors and anyone at their firm. Now, moving on to today's event, I'm very excited to introduce you all to Dan Hirsch, who, in addition to being the full-time starting short, shortstop for my firm's Bar Association softball team, has also somehow found the time to, to found and serve as the president of Engaged Prospect. Dan spent the better part of the last two decades leading national sales teams and selling to a range of high-level decision makers in a variety of industries. His work focuses on blending the best sales and marketing strategies with the most current and productive technology to get high-quality outreach and service with effective and efficient processes. He holds a master's degree in organizational leadership and is a published author focused on sales process and job design. Dan's experience led him to the realization that many emerging businesses or other small and mid-sized companies don't have the resources or capacity to implement the best sales programs. So he founded Engage Prospect or EP in 2015 to offer robust sales and marketing services and to reduce the cost of implementing best in class sales strategies and produce better business development results for its clients. If you have any questions for our speaker during the presentation, please use the Zoom Q&A function or click the hand raise button to ask a question. Um, just as a reminder, today's Zoom presentation is being recorded. Now I'd like to go ahead and turn the program over to Dan and let him get started. Thanks, Dan. All right, Adam, thank you very much. Hi, everybody. I'm glad uh, we could have so many people join. I see an awesome attendee list here with uh, several names I know. So thank you to those who joined and uh, for everybody who who I've not been able to meet yet. Um, great having you today. I'm gonna to share my screen here in just a second. Let's see here, give me a moment. All right, coming to you now. So a couple ground rules for today's session. Um, number one, let me make sure the team knows. I can see the Q&A, but as I'm presenting, I cannot see the chat. So it is possible um, that I might need some help if a chat comes through, okay? Great. Got it. Um, thank you. Okay, so, uh, and you can still see me? I'm on camera. Wait, no, Dan, you yeah. are not on camera currently. Oh, really? Okay. So that might be a problem if uh, if I'm sharing my slides, I, you can't see me. Either way, uh, let's let's just let's just move forward. So so I know a lot of folks on this call are, are coming in from from various types of organizations. So let's let's frame this discussion as keys to developing strong outbound sales for all sorts of organizations, whether you work in a startup whether you are a, a one person small business, you're an entrepreneur on your fourth company, whatever it might be, what we know in developing growth efforts is that there's a lot of different ways to do it. Your, your business and industry certainly matter, but there are some core tenants that every company in the early stages are going to go through. And then 100%, lots of core tenants that every company that is growing and scaling and adding to their sales effort, to their sales team, they go through as well. And we're going to talk about both of those things today. You guys sort of learned my background. Um, I've been 
been a, a short version, been a sales guy and the trainer for my entire career. Um, I'm really excited to be talking to this group because of such a mixed bag. My sort of specialty over the last six years um, after starting Engage Prospect has been working in, in the inside sales world, helping typically smaller organizations or those that are more maybe technical minded entrepreneurs, helping them really build out their sales effort. Not Nothing in today's hour and a 15 minute long session, hour long session is going to be focused on, on selling what we do. But I do want to take a moment and, and have you read this slide and I'll give you some an overview. Um, sort of want to share what we do for a living so that you understand as you're asking questions and, and understanding sort of who we are, my frame of reference. Um, we, we began as a company, as an outsourced sales business. So organizations hire us. We build a sales team for them. Um, we're on the north side of Pittsburgh on the River Avenue, right by PNC Park. And the reps would be my employees, work in my office, uh, COVID aside. And we would do all the sales activities to help our clients grow. We also work with companies who have an internal team. So we help in a training and coaching and recruiting and management capacity, but it's their people in their offices. And then very recently, and this will be a big piece of today's session, because I think a lot of you might fall into the category of like, I'm not ready to go build a formal sales effort. I don't want to hire people. I, I don't want to invest a ton of money. My, my needs are, I'm an entrepreneur. I work in a small organization and I need to get my pipeline filled. We have people who can close business. It's just getting in front of enough organizations is the challenge. And that seems to be the, the scaling challenges for a lot of small businesses. I know there are folks here from Steelbridge and the University of Pittsburgh and Carnegie Mellon, any, any incubator or um, university program that, that has a lot of entrepreneurs know exactly what I'm talking about, where it's, I can, I can sell my product. I can, I can definitely convince people from the technical side why this makes sense for them. It's getting in front of enough people is the challenge. So we're going to talk today about how do entrepreneurs get in front of enough people to grow their business, but also knowing that most entrepreneurs are very busy doing 25 other things, right? We all are. And so really allocating your time and energy to the right activities is sort of critical in this phase. So as an agenda, we're going to do this. Um, here's the scenario that I want to frame everybody's sort of mind on. and we can 100% break away from this with individual questions. And I know there are some people on this call with um, larger organizations that might have resources of sales. And if that's the case, a lot of these fundamentals are going to apply. And I just want to frame it that I'll be speaking mostly like this. Sarah is our entrepreneur. She starts a company. She's an absolute expert in her space. She knows the product stone cold. She built it. She understands her industry. She's worked in it forever. And she, she's ready. She wants to build a scalable, awesome company. But she's not ready to go hire a sales team. She can't just throw people at problems. And to this point, she's the sales rep. She's the CFO. She's the lead um, fundraiser. She's also the janitor and you know, needs to replace and restock the, the break room. So how does she sell? And knowing she has limited amounts of time, how does she do it? We're going to talk about that today. And we're going to break it into five sections. Her strategy, what sort of processes she should think about, what tech might be out there for her, how to analyze and understand her data so that she can spend time in the right areas, and then certainly fundamentals of being a salesperson. I also want to share that I, as I mentioned a minute ago, I can see the Q&A page on my second monitor. I can't see the chat nor the hand raises. You guys, I know, will let me know. At any moment, it will not bother me in the least. If you have a question, please chime it out. Please throw it on the Q&A. Um, this presentation is structured exactly how you see on this page right here under Sarah's sort of premise. But we can deviate at any moment and talk about a specific question that you have. It will not bother me whatsoever. So 
I want as much interaction as humanly possible. And we certainly will call on people if we're not, uh, if not, not enough questions are coming by. So be ready. Okay. So Sarah, right? She has this company. How does she go out and sell it? What's, what's her strategies? We've worked with hundreds of entrepreneurs over the last several years. And one of the most fundamental important pieces is understanding who your client is. This sort of trickles down to every other piece of the sales business, but you have to know who your client is. What are their job titles? What are their challenges? Why are, how are they different than other people in their own companies? I'll give you an example. We've done a lot of, I, I come prior to this, I worked at an organization here in town called Carnegie Learning, and we sold math materials to school districts all over the country, software, textbooks, you name it. Um, during that time, and I'm choosing this because all of us have been to school, so you sort of know the structure. Selling to a superintendent is quite different than selling to a principal of schools or a teacher. Selling to a school in Texas is quite different to say the least, than selling to a school in New York City. Understanding who your best buyer is not only is going to help you um, figure out your value proposition and understand how you're going to go after these folks, but also it helps you develop messaging. Messaging for superintendents should be different than a curriculum director or a principal. Messages to a CFO of a mid-sized business should be different than the CEO of the same business. So messaging is critical, and, and the ideal customer profile helps you think through messaging. If you start with, who is my target, and what are their challenges as it relates to things that we do that we could solve, you'll be able to come up with messaging that resonates with that type of person. That type of person, as I said a minute ago, is different than another type of person in a similar company, or obviously different types of businesses are going to have different challenges as well. In addition to helping you create messaging, it also helps you create a good sense for like, okay, how am I going to go after them? So if we were face-to-face -face today, as this type of session normally would be, um, I'd ask you just in a, in a classroom to raise your hand and tell me if, you know, LinkedIn as an outreach tool works for your business. And some people would raise their hands and others wouldn't. I'd say, okay, how about cold calling? How about digital marketing? How about trade shows? And it'd be the same, right? Some people would raise their hands and some people wouldn't. Understanding who you're selling to and what sort of they respond to and how they respond really helps you figure out your sales model. And when I say sales model, there will be more of this in a moment, but ultimately it's like, do you need to go face to face and sell your customers? Should you go to trade shows? Do you get inbound leads from your website and then call them? Do you sell retail online? Whatever it might be. These sales models, field sales, inside sales, how do you craft it matters, especially when you're going to go to phase two and Sarah gets to the point where she's able to go hire somebody. Figuring out who that somebody is and what their, their skill sets are is really important. That starts with understanding your customer. I'll give you an example. Meeting with HR directors LinkedIn and email and phone calls are excellent tools for reaching HR directors. They are not excellent tools necessarily for reaching owners of restaurants. Those are quite different people, as you'd imagine. And restaurant owners typically aren't sitting at their desk waiting for a phone call. The, the call, in fact, usually goes and, and the bar manager or the, the general manager of the store or the hostess answers the phone call. So that's just an example and maybe a weird one, but it's an example of understanding how to reach out to your buyers. We talked about messaging, but a, a, a winning value prop for, for all of those that work with entrepreneurs on this call, I'm sure you're spending a lot of time getting them to refine and hone in on the right value prop. For those that are entrepreneurs on this call, developing the right value prop is something that folks at you know, CMU and Pitt and at your, at your incubator and at your, your VC firm are definitely talking to you about all the time. My suggestion is have a different value proposition for every different scenario as it relates to your ideal customer. Again, principles are a different value proposition 
than superintendents. CFOs are different than HR directors and so on and so forth. Plus sorting by large company, small company, whatever your demographics are, it, a lot of thought has to go into this strategy. Then you have to figure out like, how do they buy? We talked about this a second ago in terms of reaching out, but let's, let's spend one minute to come up with a shared understanding of, at least for this call, of what the buyer's journey looks like. I'm gonna go through this quickly, but you will have access to these slides after the session. Um, typically, buyers go through five steps. They first identify a problem or need. So they don't want to talk to a car salesman if they don't need a new car, right? Typical, typical statement. You typically aren't going onto a car lot to just check stuff out if you have a three month old vehicle. The next step, once you've identified that, yeah, I do have a problem that my financial software isn't what I need it to be. Okay, so the next part is go out and figure out what, out, what is out there that can help you solve that problem. Then hopefully you find several as a buyer, right? I'm not talking as a salesperson, but as a buyer, you hopefully find several alternatives and you start evaluating and figuring out, you know, for those on the call, on this call that are, that are working with SaaS platforms, so that's software um, companies, right? You have a, a product that you can showcase like, here's our silver, gold, and bronze package. Um, typically, the evaluating alternatives in that respect is like little check marks on a grid, right? If you buy the platinum version, you're going to get all of the things to the left plus these features. Companies that are buying things also evaluate other vendors, of course. So evaluation is really important. Then they make a decision, and then they're a customer. So as a buyer, now you're deciding, am I happy with what I bought? Am I going to buy more? Will I renew this program a year from now? Those kinds of questions. As salespeople, now let's flip this, this on its head. As a salesperson or an entrepreneur who's responsible for growth, you need to figure out where you fit into this five-step sequence. And typically, it's one of two things. You are either helping them identify that they have a problem. So for instance, the purpose of cold calling is to identify an opportunity. The purpose of visiting potential buyers in their offices is to see if there might be a need that you can solve. That's number one. Or, I guess, and or, you're also supposed to help them understand how your solution is different than others and how you can solve their challenges. So as a salesperson, you're trying to insert yourself into this process somewhere to help buyers build awareness of who you are and understand that you might be able to help them. I'm going to stop for just a moment and tell you again that I can see Q&A, cannot see chat as I'm sharing my screen. Please share any questions, thoughts um, as, as we go. So we've talked about strategy and I, I've not been super specific because every business has to have their own strategy. The point that I would summarize and say is, please, please make sure your sales strategy aligns with your buyer's strategy. So for instance, if people don't wanna to talk to you, I'm going back a slide here, until they're ready to evaluate all alternatives, an example of this would be, uh, a bid that a company might put out for vendors. Um, if they put out a bid and have you fill out forms and they're only going to talk to you if you get to the top three, then you're inserting yourself here at step number three. So you have to understand, okay, part one and two have been skipped. I've not been part of it. How does that affect my strategy? That's just an example. Strategy is broad and it involves a lot of things, but ultimately you have to have your strategy align with how your buyers buy. That's the key. In terms of process, this talks about, okay, what do we do to get in front of enough people? How do we close those enough people? What should we do? Should we make phone calls or should we, should we buy advertising? Should we have booths at trade shows? All of these things that are more procedural are really important because especially for an entrepreneur who's busy with other things, you need to make sure you're spending your time in the right areas. Even when you have a full-fledged sales team, I, I, my largest team in the corporate setting was in the 30s um, or low 40s rather. 
and determining like who's doing what work and territory mix and all of those various things. Sales leaders are always making process and strategy decisions to to make sure that you can have enough quality and quantity output to hit your growth goals. As an entrepreneur, you don't have 40 people. You don't have you know, 40 hours a week even to spend on sales. You have to figure out where can you spend your most effective time. So here's what I would say to that. Your processes have to align to goals. And what I mean is I'll give you an example shortly for what a good cold outreach process looks like, you know, trying to identify leads. But if, if you can't close business unless these potential customers know you for years and years, then you're not probably going to try to prospect to get a demo. You might prospect to start a relationship. If your product can be sold by demo, then your process is going to be, how can I get more demos? If you need to be on site, I spoke with a customer this morning who feels like he needs to be on site to showcase his product into hospitals. And if that's the case, then setting up a demo probably doesn't make sense as a process. So the, the goal of process is to align them to the goals that you have for, for growing your business, aligning them to the ideal customer profile and how buyers buy. Then you need to understand that it might take a long time to start converting whatever process it is. The third bullet point down says it takes seven attempts to reach a decision maker. And for most industries, that's relatively true. It takes a lot of outreach to get somebody to want to have a conversation with you. If you remember, people tend not to want to learn about something if they don't have a challenge that could be solved by said something. And that's, of course, not true all the time. But if that is true, and there's statistics that say at any given time, 3% of your total market might be looking to buy something. If that's the case, imagine how many calls fall on deaf ears, how many LinkedIn messages don't resonate, how many TV commercials they see that, you know, they don't want. Apparently, people only buy cars at Christmas time per commercials, but that's a big thing, right? That they must, they must have a lot of data that says that's the right time to try to connect with people. And then you have to figure out, is it an inbound or outbound process? So let's talk about some processes. There are typically three processes and a ton of permutations underneath those. Prospecting is an activity of reaching out to people to try to build awareness and identify people out there that are interested in talking further about what you do. That's prospecting. Most of you know cold calls or sending emails, LinkedIn. Should you do those things? Should you go to conferences if you can? Should you buy a Super Bowl ad if you can, as this slide talks about? The answer is yes. You should do everything you possibly can. The challenge for Sarah is she doesn't have money to do all of those things. So really choosing the right activities to drive new prospects is critical for her. That could also be marketing. That could be writing SEO, search engine optimization for her website, writing blogs, videos, those kinds of things help prospect. The second part is then opportunities, making sure for Sarah's case that she's able to stay in front of the people that are interested in talking to her and work them through the process of closing business. And then you have a process and you, you need to for current customers. Current customer processes would be things like newsletters and following up with them every month or two or three months to make sure they're doing okay. You might have a process for upselling other products. Those processes are really important. What they do is not only make sure you're staying on top of all of your work, but also as every entrepreneur on this call knows, and frankly, you don't have to be an entrepreneur to know this, just if you're a busy professional, you know that you're gonna spend as much time choosing what not to do as what you choose to do. And so having the right processes, making sure you're targeting the right people and staying in front of them enough is critical as it relates to a busy entrepreneur trying to determine what he or she does every day. This is the buyer's journey. We talked about this a little bit ago. I, I won't really spend much time talking about it, but I wanted you to have it for our slide deck. Um, and if you want to watch the video again, ultimately there are four places where you are touching your potential customers 
and your current customers. And these four steps are basically basically how it's done. You need to build awareness and get people to know who you are. Then you need to have a conversation with them at some point. Typically, if you're a retail, you know, Amazon certainly doesn't talk to us before we buy shoes, but, but you probably get the point. Most of your businesses are in this process. Then you work them through certain criteria to, to get to a proposal, to get to being able to purchase. And now they're a customer and you have a lot of other things to do to stay in front of them. Re- review this. It's slide eight. Look back at this. And there's a ton of stuff online that talks about the buyer's journey. So, again, as we change slides, I want to say Q&A is open, um, so on and so forth. The, the challenge that most people have when they start a business at the beginning, and this would apply to our hypothetical Sarah example, is that Sarah, as I said, was an industry expert. Many of you started businesses because you knew something in the market because you were in it. And you went and built a service or product around solving whatever challenge it was. For, for me, same thing. I was the client of some outsourced sales consulting organizations. And I thought we could do it better. And that's why I started this company. So I really understood my business. I understood the industry and so on and so forth. What happens to these entrepreneurs is you, you start a business and usually you're, you know, emailing to your friends and family and people in your network and saying like, hey, I just started this. We'd love to talk. You know, probably you had 30 coffee meetings in the first two months with people just to talk about what you're trying to do. What happens, though, when you run out of people that you know, your Rolodex is gone, your LinkedIn is, is um, thoroughly exhausted? Now what? We're ready to, like, go from my first few customers to getting more and more people that don't know us. And how do you do that? There's five things. We've talked about two. You have to have the right strategies. You have to have the right um, processes. And a lot of that can be extremely manual until you're ready to scale in the sense of your customer base. So for those on the call that talk about scaling, um, sales efforts or revenue or users, you'll know that technology is a huge source of helping companies scale. For instance, you could go from, you could have five customers on a sheet of paper and never put them into what's called a CRM, Client Relationship Manager. You could have five customers and never lose track of what they need, what, who they are, what their email number, addresses are, phone numbers, et cetera. The minute you want to go and get 20 and 30 and 50 and 100 new customers, now you need a place to start keeping track of them. And that's technology. There's also technology of reaching out to people, using tech to do that, using tech to automate certain processes. And this slide mostly has it's five bullet points, and I'll read it for those who aren't looking at the screen. Contact lists, where do you get your data? The second would be databases, keeping them in, keeping that contact list and your customer list in a database to not lose track. How do you outreach, provide outreach? So that could be phone or email or LinkedIn or live chat or whatever. Automation. How do you automate some of the processes that you're currently doing so that you can do more with less time? And then where do you store and collect data so that you can look to see what's working and what's not, et cetera? Um, thank you, Doug. Um, sorry to, to go sidetrack here, but it sounds like I'm on slide 10 and you're only seeing slide nine. I, I am looking at slide 10. So let me, let me move some things here. All right. Now I'm back to nine. Now I'm back to 10. So Doug, if that did not, answer, if that didn't help, let us know again. And for everyone else looking at the screen, perfect. See in 10. All right. Thanks, Doug. Um, these five bullet points, I'm not going to tell you, there are lists and names of companies on this sheet, but my purpose is not to sell a specific tool. It's simply to tell you and sell you on, you should have access to these kinds of things, especially as a busy entrepreneur, you don't have 40, 50 hours a week to be salesperson. You need to try to 
be as efficient as possible. If you Google these various bullet points, not word for word, of course, but the, the, the first part of the bullet points, you'll see crazy amounts of potential vendors out there. And certainly it depends on your type of business, who you're reaching out to, who you are, your budget, all of those things of what you buy. But these five things should be had at some point, whether it's a very small business or you're ready to hire 100 sales reps. It doesn't really matter. The purpose of this technology, let's talk, let, let me give you an example from, from what we do. So I guess I will tell you a little bit, but I'm not recommending these programs for you by any means until I know sort of who you are and what you're trying to do. But when we work with an organization and um, we are starting from scratch, there's no sales effort, here's, here's what we do. Um, and it's only one example. There's tons that we'll try to do. But one would be, we, we have access to Zoom info and to LinkedIn sales navigator. We think that email, phone, and LinkedIn, aside from trade shows and maybe going to see the customer live, those are the, the three best tools for driving the business. So we have access to a, a really good database called Zoom Info, and it's also Discover Org. Those databases are really good to search, and I can say, show me all of the CEOs of 25-person companies in Pennsylvania, and it gives me this list. That's one way of generating a contact list. Another is through LinkedIn. Then you need to put it into a database. So we need to keep track of, let's say there's 100 people on my list. Well, five of them are going to answer the phone and tell me right away they're not interested. 20 are never going to respond ever. And the remaining 85 or however many are going to at some point in seven tries or eight tries, they're going to have a conversation with us. So I need to keep track of who they are and what conversations we've had and all of those things. We, we use a variety of tools here for our clients. For ourselves, we use HubSpot and a company called Sales Loft, those two. That's how we start reaching out. We do a sequence of back and forth, phone calls, emails, LinkedIn messages, all of these things to try to drive a first conversation. And that would be contact list, database, and outreach. Now, where do you automate stuff? You can automate emails. You can automate, you know, if we send a personalized email for the first email out of the gate, we can automate some of the follow-up emails to save time from the salesperson or from the entrepreneur. You can automate inbound leads. And an example would be for, for those of you who are entrepreneurs on this call, you get an inbound lead, it probably is an email sent to you. And you're like, oh, cool, I got this lead. I have to do something with it. That can be automated and a, an email can go out immediately upon getting that lead. Or you might be notified in your CRM system, HubSpot or Salesforce can tell you, you got this new lead and we created the record for you. So you didn't have to do any manual work. Now just call the person. There's a lot of ways of automating certain processes to help you, one, save time, and two, make sure you don't lose track of certain people. And then data. All of this information gets collected in the form some way of data. You can run a report to see how many inbound leads you just received. You can run a report to see if I make, you know, 100 phone calls, how many people do I speak to? If I send out this many LinkedIn messages, which types of people are responding? Um, this data from a sales perspective specifically is extremely important for a few reasons. I think the most important is not conversion rates. So conversion rates are like how many calls or discussions does it take to create an opportunity? How many opportunities does it create, take to get a demo? How many demos must I give in order to get someone a proposal? And how many of those do I need to win a deal? That is really important as it relates to where are there gaps in the process? Where are there gaps in terms of training? You know, if, if you're great at getting people to a demo and no one becomes a customer after that, it's probably something we're doing with the demo, right? Or if you can't get demos, but you're great at closing them, we need to figure out how to be a better prospector. Those things are important, but I believe that messaging and back to the ideal customer profile and your, your buyer's journey, I think messaging is one of the most important things. And with automation and technology in general, you can have one 
message go out to this group of people and another message go out to a very similar group of people and see what performs better. Digital marketing agencies do this all the time as it relates to ads and, and everything. So my point is understanding your data and what's resonating from a messaging standpoint is critical to help you increase sales if you're a business owner or entrepreneur and you're not spending 40, 50 hours a week selling. You can then spend more time on the right things and less time on what's not working. And the only way you know that is through data collection. I'm going to slide 11 now, maybe. Not working. Hang on. There we go. All right, Doug, you're up. If I uh, didn't flip over, you're, you're that guy now. Thank you. Um, so from a data perspective, what's important? Knowing what's working and what's not working, which I just shared. <laughs> Thanks, Doug. <laughs> um, setting goals and understanding expectations for scaling. Those that work at in VC now um, will know. I assume you're always asking your potential companies, like, you know, if we gave you X number of dollars, what are you going to turn it into? And there are ways that you can say, well, hey, look, for the last three months, we have done this much work in prospecting. And we've generated this many opportunities and had this many proposals. If we're able to generate twice as many opportunities, we think we're going to yield this result. And that's your sort of your scaling plan, right? Um, it also helps you figure out how many people you need. It also figures out a variety of things. Um, this data is super important, as I just said, for investors. That's the third bullet, fourth bullet point down. But also key partners. So... Bringing on a co-founder, if it, it, I don't know if you can call them a co-founder, but bringing a key partner into your company or, or making your first sales hire, you have to know, okay, like I expect you to bring in X number of dollars as a quota sales guy because I was able to bring in X number of dollars doing the same type of work. And I only spent half of my time doing it. So you should be, you know, whatever, I'm making that up. But this data, understanding data is really important. And I will tell you, you know, I talk to probably on average, like five business owners a day, whether they're our clients or potential clients or speaking like this. And I'd say that it's actually less than 40% of people that know their, their data as it relates to sales. Um, food for thought. All right, then you need to know where the data is located. Every, every technology platform, for the most part, will have re record, um, reporting. So that's important. Also, this isn't really my specialty, but Google Analytics, understanding where people are looking at your website, what pages they're reviewing, all of those things. And then, and then other, other sources, more anecdotal data, like where your leads are coming from, your pipeline, what people are telling you. We've developed three products since we started as a compass services, I guess they're called, we've developed three of our four after the business was launched because of feedback we got from our potential customers and current customers. That's, that's proof that I believe very strongly in understanding what the market is telling you and pivoting and changing to reflect that. As a business owner now, so this last bullet point talks about start collecting data now you can analyze at any other point during time. What I mean by that is, you know, I know a lot of this is like, cool. Yeah, I, I, totally. I'm going to go get all the best tech. I'm going to develop this really good process if I can figure that out. And I'm going to, you know, understand my buyer. But like, I don't know how to do a lot of this stuff. That's fine. Start just collecting the basics. Understand that 20% of your customer base is CFOs and the other 80% are managers in finance. So you know that going to the super high person in the C-level person in the company maybe isn't where you need to spend time. Or understanding that most of your clients are in the Pacific Northwest. Huge opportunity for you then to analyze and, and spend time and resources targeting those kinds of companies. Whatever it is, I'm making these examples up, but my point is just start collecting now. Understanding some baseline will start to help. And if, if Sarah, to this example, isn't like an expert as it relates to analyzing sales data or building sales technologies, that's okay. At some point, if she's able to find success, she will bring on a VP of sales or a sales business development representative 
or somebody like engaged prospect or somebody in, you know, a distributor somewhere, she's going to be able to sort of bring in some support and analysis can start then too, but she has to have some data for analysis to be done. Slide 12 are five things that I think are really important for being good salespeople. So we, we have a program here at Engage Prospect that helps entrepreneurs. It's like a boot camp. It's a one month, two day a week, two, two hours a week, really, program to help entrepreneurs become better salespeople. And that's not a plug for this program, but this program, uh, Doug, thank you. Hang on. All right, I'm now back to 11. I'm back now on 12. This program is designed to help entrepreneurs better understand how to do the, like the soft skill stuff of sales. And the five biggest things are being able to deliver your value proposition in a way that is compelling and resonates with your buyer is like numero uno for sure. Listening and asking good questions and not talking 100% of the time, which remember, please ask questions and, and things on this Q&A. But not talking all the time for a salesperson is critical. And tend, we tend, salespeople tend to talk a lot. You probably all agree with that. I'm going to tell you right now, entrepreneurs talk even more about their products. They love it because we started our business because we love what we do, right? And we think, you know, this, this platform is the greatest thing in the world. And it probably is, guys. I, I looked at a lot of company names on this list today and very, very interesting work we're all doing. But your buyer doesn't want to hear all of this stuff until they understand if you can help them or not. And they need to share what their challenges are before you can make an assumption that you can help them. So we're going to talk about active listening and how to ask good questions, what questions to ask. All of these things can be Googled if you realize you're deficient as it relates to time management. You know, we chose today to not really do a session on time management because you can Google that. There's videos and blog posts and all sorts of stuff out there. But these are the five most critical things as an entrepreneur you have to be good at. You have to be able to prioritize your time of 100%. And then you need to be able to have enough testimonial, and I don't mean necessarily on your website, but just be able to tell stories about, oh yeah, that's, that's an interesting reason for using this product. Let me tell you about one of our clients a few years ago that had the same problem you have, and she used this to do X, Y, and Z. And here's what she found. Those kinds of statements are critical as it relates to being able to get buyers to see themselves using your service or understanding why your product is better than others, so on and so forth. Okay, so we're getting close to the time where it is, I mean, we're not getting, we are at the time where Q&A, audio, you can ask questions verbally, um, you can type them in, but I want to start soliciting some questions. I think that'll drive the rest of the conversation for today, and if no questions are asked, we will, we will come up with some, some deeper dives into some of these pieces. But I'm going to go off of camera or stop recording, I guess, and come back on camera so I can, you can see me. And then we can always go back into the slide deck if needed. But give me one second, please. All right, stop share. All right, get your questions ready. Can you see, I can't see me. Can you guys see me? Dan, we, we can we see you. Um, and I'm gonna take myself off mute for a second because while I can see the Q&A as a, as a uh, presenter here, I can't actually ask a question myself. Um, <laughs> Great. Given, given kind of some of the folks um, on, on the, the webinar today and, and tuned in, and the fact that a lot of us kind of come at this from a service provider perspective, um, as yeah. well as, you know, I see some folks representing the various kind of incubators and accelerators around the city. Um, do you have any tips or, or thoughts on ways that, that 
those of us who aren't business operators ourselves, but support entrepreneurs and emerging businesses in, in various ways can kind of, you know, help to set them up to be successful from a sales perspective, even though that isn't, you know, why they, why they come, come talk to us, you know, not understand that basically everything you've talked about for the past 45 minutes can apply to that in some context. If you have any particular mm -hmm. thoughts that, that could be good for those of us that, that aren't, you know, direct kind of entrepreneurs ourselves, but, but rather, you know, supporters of those folks in the community. Yeah. Yeah. So, so my answer will probably respond to the question, but also talk to other types of partnerships, right? So just two organizations trying to figure out how they can help each other. That might be you and, you know, a, a key partner in industry in some capacity too. But yeah, Adam, to your point, um, I think it's a few things. One, I think, I think most of the time, you uh, let's use you and me as an example, right? If you were looking to help me, I'm the entrepreneur in this scenario. I think a lot of times you have trouble helping me because you don't have an excellent understanding of one, how you can help me. So the entrepreneur needs to be vocal about what he or she can benefit from. Number two, you might not have a, a perfect understanding of application or of how my business works and how it can help other organizations, right? So like, I think too often entrepreneurs spend their time with guys like you really like diving deep into like, here's the cool stuff about my product and what we're doing. I would reframe that a little bit in communication. You want to like share what your business does and, and where you need help and how you could use help in a way that, resonates with the person like you. So really painting a good picture, telling stories, and this is the last slide talking about like communication best practices, telling stories of applications and, and challenges that they have and challenges that their company solves, frames in your mind, like really makes them under, you understand what they do, which allows you to better understand how you can help them. That that's sort of my gut answer is being sure that you're able to communicate not just like what the technical aspect of the product is, but what it does, how it helps buyers, how it solves problems. Those kinds of answers I think are, are critical as it relates to getting support from other people. No, that's great. And maybe I can flip that on its head a little bit too, for the benefit of, of, the service providers on the call, you know, the we we lawyers and accountants, as we try to, you know, market ourselves to entrepreneurs and emerging businesses, you know, kind of from that side of the table, um, any any particular thoughts or or tips um, when when the relationship is kind of, of of that sort versus you know being the actual yeah. business operator trying to sell a, a product or or service. A hundred percent. Give give me an example. You don't have to say the company name since we have a, a big crowd here, but give me two examples of very diverse kinds of clients you might have. Okay. Um, I mean, you know, my practice is, represents companies anywhere from, you know, somebody who developed an idea when they were a student at a local university and are trying to spin that out all the way up to local publicly traded companies. So it, it really, you know, runs the gamut. And obviously, you know, they're very different parts of my practice and, and I approach those clients and, and potential clients in those various areas very differently. But, um, you know, the spectrum is pretty wide. A hundred percent. So, so you just, you just said one thing that was a thorough concept during this session, right? Which is you approach each of those people differently based on who they are. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So that, that's a number one, good for you. That goes back to the ideal customer profile and messaging for that person, value prop for that person. But it, in terms of like, hey, Bill, the entrepreneur from CMU that works at Alpha Lab and also the, um, you know, with the CMU entrepreneur program, I'm doing work with you. 
you know a little bit of what I've done for you. You need to be able to craft a phrase or two or three or, or an email or something to say, hey, Bill, do you, have a, do you have any other, you know, entrepreneurs in your CMU cohort that it would make that are, that are at this part of the process in starting out their businesses? You know, I'm, I'm looking to grow my, my book of business also. And these are the kinds of people we solve challenges for. That is better than just saying, hey, Bill, I'm an attorney. And if you ever know any business owners that need help, let me know. The reason why it's better is Bill now thinks you, and I'm not saying trick Bill, right? But Bill, you want Bill to think that you are the foremost person to talk to if you're a startup and need legal counsel. Not just cross all businesses, I represent company. You want Bill to think you specialize and you have a niche in startup worlds. The guy at PNC Bank that you work with, who, you know, is not a startup, that same pitch isn't going to work for that person. So for that person, it might be a different, a different topic, right? Hey, are there any other, you know, 2 billion plus companies in Pittsburgh or, or West Virginia in the oil and gas industry that you think are challenged with these things? That would be your conversation to that person. Good stuff. So yeah, would would encourage anyone else, um, you know, in the Q and A window uh, to to kind of speak up um, with, with anything that might be on your mind. So, so who here? Maybe we could do this if you want to do it through chat. Let let's do it. But who here is an entrepreneur, and one of your biggest challenges is time management. And I want to I want to dig into that. Do you, who here on the call does not have resources to go out and be a salesperson? I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. You don't have resources to go out and hire a bunch of people to be your sales team. You're the salesperson, but you're being pulled from all directions and, and time management is a really, really challenging thing. Okay, I see Tanya responded. Awesome. So, so for those and for you, Tanya, um, let's talk about that. What, what activities typically get pushed aside when you're busy with existing clients, your product development, various meetings, investors, what tends to fall to the wayside and you don't end up doing, even though you know you want to and should? I'll wait a second to see if, if there's any responses. That certainly might have been a, a difficult question. So I'll, I'll give some examples. But if you think back to our, um, our presentation, we talk about three different sort of buckets, right? There's prospecting, finding new opportunities, then working those opportunities to get them to close. And then finally, now you're a customer and there's work that's involved in managing customers, right? So... I see all the time and actually saw this at Carnegie Learning, my last corporate gig prior to starting EP, we saw that the busier you get with business in general, the more typically prospecting for new business goes away. And it's because you don't have time. Whether you're a salesperson or an entrepreneur or a, somebody in, in business development at a bank, it doesn't matter. You're so busy with value in terms of customers and people that want to be customers that you tend not to do prospecting efforts. My suggestion in that sense is to figure out how can I prospect efficiently? Maybe not even spend a bunch of time. Maybe it's just emails. Maybe it's just LinkedIn outreach. There are tools out there that can help you keep a prospecting effort going without spending a bunch of human time. And I'd say do it just Make sure the messaging is right, that you're, you're you know, you, you certainly you're not, you're not ready just from this session to like go out and conquer the world, but hopefully it gives you the scaffolding to go out and say, okay, I'm going to prospect, I'm going to create this email flow that can get me a couple meetings every month that are just coming to me. That is 
critical to make sure that your new business sort of the hose isn't turned off, if you know what I mean. You may not have 40 hours a week to be a prospector. No problem. Do something to make sure you're reaching out to potential customers. So she said, I think it's a list. I think it's, I think it's building the unique communication with the prospects. We have to have more personalized messages. And now we have a few email templates and edit the messages a few times a month. Awesome. That's great. So it's, it's determining what kind of messaging um, in terms of time management. It's the time, she's saying, I believe, it's the time spent to have personalized, crafted messages. Um, and it takes time to do that, right? You have to research who you're reaching out to and what their website's like, what their challenges are. Did they go to your college on LinkedIn? All of those things, right? Then you have to figure out what message am I going to get to them based on type of company, type of job title, all of those things. And then finally, <clears throat> having enough time to do that during the month is, is tough. I'll give you one, one weird example that's very specific, but we, we leverage it very successfully all the time. Our technology, I mentioned we use a company called Sales Loft, which there are a thousand competitors and lots of companies do this, but you can send in our first message, we tend to personalize very um, about 25%, 20 to 25% of the first message is personalized. So, you know, hey, Bill, I see you went to my college and you are friends with my best friend from high school and blah, blah, blah. I was on your LinkedIn and I've been researching you. I also checked out your website and yada, yada, yada. And then 80% or so is templated, okay? By the way, 20% is the magic number. Um, 100% is a waste of time. 5% isn't enough personalized. Over the, the course of millions of messages, this is not our study, but a study was done, 20% of personalization is the best. Why I'm bringing that up is you can send that first email out, which let's say takes five minutes to research and write. There are tools that can then help you in the second message. Let's say it's sent five days later. If they don't reply to me, send a message two. Message two can reference the first message and all of the research and, and personalization that you did. And it can have similar messaging within email two. And you don't have to do anything. It's automated. That saves you another five minutes or another three minutes to research your notes. Now you have a few messages going out that are relatively personal that speak to why you're reaching out to that person in the first place, but you can capitalize on the tech to not spend human time doing all of those things. Very specific, I realize, but I hope that helps. Is there a best practice? This was asked, is there a best practice to follow up with prospects who have not responded to initial contact, or should we test that time range as well? Yeah, so if the prospect hasn't responded to initial contact, number one is commit to memory that it takes on average seven of those tries to have your first conversation. So don't give up after two. Unfortunately, here's the, another statistic. In the sales world, salespeople give up typically after two tries. You send, you meet someone at a trade show or they leave, a, let's say they leave a business card in a fishbowl. You follow up with them once, they don't respond. You send them a follow-up email, they don't respond and you think, I don't wanna bug them, so I'm gonna leave them alone. It's gonna take seven tries on average. So the best practice is number one, commit to your standard operating procedure, if you will, that it's going to take about seven, maybe 10 times. In terms of the test that time range, I think of a few things. I don't know if you specifically mean like how many days should you, you know, don't send them six emails a day, naturally. Don't call them several times a day. I would say in the course of one month, if you reach out to the right prospect seven, eight, nine, 10 times, that's enough to be persistent but not enough to be overwhelming or a, a nuisance. The second you have that first conversation, now you're getting into the, um, 
critical thinking part of the process, the opportunity process. Now you get to pick and choose. Okay, I talked to Bill today. He's going on a week's vacation and then needs time to really review our discussion before scheduling another call. But you have spoken to Bill. You could choose four months from now as your next outreach because you've talked to Bill. But if you've not yet started a conversation, he doesn't reply to an email or a LinkedIn message or return your phone calls. I would say seven, you know, just to give you a rule of thumb, I don't know, seven to 10 times in a month or a month and a half is a very appropriate number. And then after that month, maybe slow it down a bit. Maybe don't reach back out to Bill as a specific person for another month. Give it a month off. And then maybe reach out once every three weeks for six months. That process is, is up in the air, De depending on the, the customer, depending on their time of year, depending on your company and what service you have. You know, accountants probably give up. Don't really target them in March, right? Um, March, April are going to be really tough for them. April 16th, I guarantee they don't want to get a cold call. But like after their week vacation or two-week vacation, then, then start hitting them back up. And I, I don't know that. Totally. Uh, we can ask some folks on this call that are accountants, but, you know, time of year matters, so on and so forth. Good question. Thank you for asking that. Who else has some questions? It certainly does not have to be necessarily around this, these topics. It can be anything. A lot of organizations ask us, like, how do you know when it's time to scale? And um, I, I'll, I'll definitely jump on any inbound questions that come in. But um, in terms of scaling, right, Sarah wants to go from her Rolodex to 20 customers, then 20 to 100 probably. Then what's next? And it's usually more people, more more resources to, to invest in, to grow the efforts even further once you've shown product market fit and once you've shown you can bring an ROI on, on what you're doing. The data as it relates to that is, is pretty important. I think, you know, whether it's anecdotal or quantitative, I think you need to best understand, like, I'm spending four hours a week as a salesperson and I am identifying two opportunities every week that are interested in talking further. Therefore, if I spent 40 hours a week, I should probably identify 20 opportunities. And I'm simple math that doesn't always work like that. But um, those kinds of questions to yourself are really important. Think also in terms of scaling, like what can your, and this is more on the operational side of your business, but like what can you handle? Um, you know, I could not handle an influx of 600 new customers in the month of February, but a software business certainly can. So those kinds of questions matter too. Any thoughts on the best sales tack on, on hardware, best sales tactic, an in-person demo example in the current pandemic. Wow, Adam. Hang on. All right. I should, I, should, I should have just spoken just up. Talk, I was yeah. trying to be quick. I, I was making reference to the example when you were talking about, you know, different products having being sold successfully differently. You know, you have folks that I think you said it was like a hospital example, like an in-person setting being the best place to, sure. to sell something. Um, obviously, sure. you know, folks that fall into that category have been really limited in various ways over the past, you know, almost year now. So just generally from a, whether it's a limited ability to meet with prospects in person to show them a demo of the product, limited opportunity yeah. to engage with people, you know, over drinks from a more casual business development perspective, whatever, um, just kind of COVID specific thoughts. Yeah, well, COVID specific and also just the timeline of the world is that that inside sales is the, 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 I'll loosely define it real quick. Inside sales is usually the same abilities as field sales or outside sales, which has been going on forever, right? You meet with companies face to face, you sit down, you shake hands, you ask them questions, you learn about what their challenges are, and then you show them something and you say like, this is what we'll do. 
that has been for years moving more towards, hey, I don't have to fly to St. Louis to have this conversation with this guy. I can just like get on a Zoom call, right? That's been changing over over time. Not for every product. I, I get it. If you're, you know, showing a a capital equipment piece to a hospital, like they need to probably see it. You need to look at their facility. I get it. But there are some components of the sales process that 100% has shifted to in office, Zoom calls, Skype calls, phone calls, emails back and forth. COVID exacerbated that a thousand percent, if that's possible, and and mandated it for a long time for a lot of companies. So everybody now has experienced selling virtually and also buying virtually. That is 100%. If all of our grandmas have been on Zoom, then you know that your buyers certainly can get on a Google Hangout or a Zoom call to, to learn more about your product. With that said, there will be there will be some, you know, I don't know what it's called, but like as the tide comes in and out, the tide will go back out a little bit. And those that prefer to sell or buy in person and those that think, you know, gee, I, I need to be at networking events. I need to do these things. That will certainly happen again. But what I think has certainly changed with COVID is the practice of inside sales. It is now routine 100% to get emails that say, hey, this is, what your challenges probably are. This is what we do. Do you want to set up some time to talk about it? I think people are certainly better using video and, and video conferencing. And I think it's becoming common that that won't probably go, go backwards. You just need to figure out your process. If you remember back to the sales process piece, where in the process must you be face-to-face -face if you have to be face-to-face? And for those that think you have to for the entire process, I would challenge you to, to think about that. Um, the guy this morning that I referenced who's selling, selling to, you know, typically on site to hospitals, he thought the first meeting needed to be on site. So what he wanted to do was go, go after companies, hospital systems in certain territories and say like, hey, I'm going to be in Buffalo next week. Could we meet on Tuesday or Wednesday? And I said, what would it change if maybe the first meeting was a phone call or a video call and then you could pre-qualify them and then say, hey, you know what? This is great, Mike. Thanks for spending 15 minutes with me. I'm going to be in Buffalo next Tuesday. Could I come and actually show you the things that we're talking about? Or could I bring you a cup of coffee or Panera and we can sit down and talk about this further? That might be a better use of his time given that for sure, inside sales is more efficient. The, the price range for a sale, for inside sales to really make sense, is a minimum of $2,500. This is very loose. A minimum of $2,500 per customer up to unlimited amounts of money, but usually like eighty, ninety, dollars $100,000 solutions, you can still close via inside sales. You don't need outside sales. In this, of course, very broad range. The minute you get into selling a $1.9 million solution, they probably are going to require to meet you. Um, if you sell an airplane, you know, Boeing jet to Southwest Airlines, they're going to need to see the airplane. You get the point, right? But you can do some of those pieces from your home office and then go on site for whatever is needed. Long answer, Adam. I hope that was okay, but <clears throat> that's my thoughts there. That was great. All right. uh I'll wait yeah. for any more questions, but I know these guys are going to wrap up. I would like to just take a moment and say that I know in a video call and back to, so, so video calls are great. I just advocated for them for six minutes, but I do want to say that certainly, you know, you can't ask as many questions on a zoom presentation like this. It, it's a little more like tell you stuff versus interact and that stinks, but, but I hope this was okay. And I want to personally thank all of you. Um, I am open to, I'll go, well, my slides are, you'll get my slides. My email is on the last slide. I'm sure it's also in the invite. Um, at any time, if you want to connect and ask specific questions or throw a specific scenario by me and, and say, what would you do here? Or, hey, I'm vetting these technology tools. What do you think? Whatever. Um, I have a question about training. You know, I don't, I don't know how to do this one thing. Happy to help you 
um, talk you through it, all of those things, not a problem whatsoever. So I know we, it's hard to do that on this session, but I really do want to thank you guys for joining and for, um, for hosting for the, for the PVCA. Thank you guys for putting this together. It was, I hope, I hope worth it. <laughs> thank yeah, you. No, Dan, thank you again. Um, I, I think we can, you know, all agree that the, the presentation was fantastic and, and, uh, engaging which can be rare um to your point when it comes to kind of the zoom world we live in now so really appreciate kind of the extra effort there um and, and i think it's going to be very helpful to a lot of the attendees um that joined us today so we look forward dan to, to you hopefully continuing to be a resource for the pvca community and and obviously hope um we all have the the opportunity to connect soon in person um but in any event, thanks to everyone for attending today. Um, a survey link will be emailed to you following the webcast. Um, really appreciate your feedback as we move forward and, and kind of continue to optimize relevant virtual programming here. Um, the next PVCA virtual event is a life science cluster panel program moderated by Evan Fokker, the, the Vice Chancellor for Innovation and Entrepreneurship at the University of Pittsburgh. That's on Thursday, February 18th at 2 p.m. Um, we obviously hope that you all will join us. Thanks again for joining us today and thanks again to Dan. Um, everyone enjoy the rest of your day. Bye guys. Thank you.